Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. Hello, I'm Ryan McMakin, a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And the great libertarian economist and historian Murray Rothbard was born 95 years ago this week. So that means it's Rothbard Week here at the Mises Institute, with a great many Rothbard-themed articles at Mises.org. And here to jump on that bandwagon with me is Tho Bishop, our associate editor. How are you, Tho? Doing great, and uh, a, a great week for uh, to celebrate a great man. <laughs> and uh, Tho and I are going to talk about what we think are some of the best things about Rothbard from our perspective, just our personal opinions and specifically some of the best things about his writings and his work that really changed our thinking on matters of the state, human rights, and related issues. And I should note for the audience that both Tho and I are coming at this as people who never knew Rothbard personally. We're looking at him as a historical figure, as a writer who we've engaged only through his writings and research. So we're, we're going to be bringing uh, that perspective from the under-45 crowd or under-40 those uh, quite a bit younger than me, at least 10 years younger, I think, something like that. And uh, so we're of that those later generations, though, where, uh, where Rothbard is, is gone and you, you don't meet him at any conferences and you're engaging him through his writing. But I still always found it extremely engaging. I think we both did. And we're going to talk about a little bit of that today. So, Tho, why don't you kick us off with uh, the top of your short list on uh what what are the greatest things about Rothbard? I regrettably, never had late night Denny's uh, diner food with, with Murray. It's something I really wish uh, wish I could have had the experience to, to have. But uh, I, I'm going to start off because I, I think this is often one of the most controversial aspects of Murray Rothbard. But it's also, in, particularly in recent years, I've I've enjoyed the most, and it's uh, '90s Rothbard. And you know, because he he wrote for one. I mean, Rothbard wrote so much at you know so many different periods of time, but I, I think there's, there's a few articles in particular um, that I, I, I find, every time I reread them, and I, 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 I find myself gravitating to them a couple times a year, um, uh, three articles in particular, and, and they were speeches that he, uh, when he first delivered them, uh, was one was a, a Nations by Consent, or actually it was a journal article, Nations by Consent, uh, Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature, and Strategy for the Right. And um, if strategy, we, we've talked a little bit in the past in this podcast about strategy for the right, and I'm not going to you know, spend too much time on that uh, because of uh, because of that. You know, but you know, the, the importance of understanding that you know having all the right ideas in the world, um, you know, if, if you can't find a way of communicating them and to to the people and be able to 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 build an ideological movement um, in ways that uh, uh, other people might, might otherwise not, you know. It, it, Making these ideas relevant to people that are not just professional economists, um, and, and Rothbard, I think, was really, you know, this was him at his most powerful, um, recognizing that you know the the audience for libertarian ideas first and foremost are kind of you know, the the middle class of America that are that are getting ripped off the most, right? And I think that's that aspect of strategy for the right, which um, is, is something I've always I, I think is is makes it. Uh, such a, a fascinating and, and important piece. Um, and I, again, I, I think it kind of looks down upon from a lot of libertarian scholars because like, h- here's him working outside of the ivory tower of academia um, and, and trying to make this relevant. And, and that's something that you see throughout his life, right? You, 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 the, the, all the work that he did in the libertarian movement, the, the newsletters and things like that. You know, he was able to build a, pl- a, a, a movement behind these libertarian ideas uh, because of his recognition and the importance of that. Um, egalitarianism as a revolt against nature, which e- even though it was, uh, I believe it was uh, given you know, in the in the seventies and not the nineties, I think it it um, you know it, it's it's a it's a work that um, I think was it, it, when, you, when you consider the, the environment of the nineties, right, the kind of the Clintonian era, um, the, the the growth of kind of that authoritarian egalitarian sort of axis. You think Harrison Bergeron. Rather than uh, 1984, which is kind of more nationalistic in its way, you know, we're always at war with some with another country, right? You know, whereas in Her- Harrison Bergeron's sort of dystopian sort of novel, the the, the danger was the way that the state um, would would handicap individuals in ways to with the pursuit of making us all equal. And I think that if you, you see this with his political writings and uh, with with the the Rock, Rothbard Rockwell report and other areas where you know he saw 
and that one of the great political threats to liberty manifesting itself was this kind of state-imposed, the state pursuit of, of egalitarian values. And, and you, know, uh, you know, this was kind of work done with the uh, Center for Libertarian Studies, right? And so he was trying to, to help provide it this larger intellectual framework for libertarian theory itself and highlighting the dangers. And, and you see this still play out, I think, with, with some you know, academic libertarian circles, this idea that all inequalities are sort of produced by the state and things like that. And, and if you kind of start trying to correct them through with, with a, a, a heavy hand of the state, it can lead to all sorts of very dangerous outcomes. And I, I think that particularly living in, in 2020, uh, 2021, you know, this this era, the the egalitarian nature of uh, uh, the, the the state is, I think, you know, a, a the the greatest threat. Whereas maybe like the early 2000s, right? You had uh, after war on terror era, um, it was kind of that that more nationalistic sort of threat. Um, you know, I I think that the relevance of that work. And, and the importance of, of highlighting the dangers of that is, is particularly relevant in today's world. Um, and the other side of it is, is nations by consent, um, which, you know, in the 90s, not only did you have a fascinating sort of political environment of, of kind of the Pat Buchanan sort of populist aspect of politics, um, but, you know, one of the, the, the real defining moments of that era, and you see this reflected throughout Rothbard's work this time, you know, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so with nations by consent, you know, it, it was in many ways, I think Rothbard is most kind of politically Misesian, right? And uh, your work on uh, how uh, uh, political decentralization, the, the similarities that has with kind of Rothbard's idea of anarcho-capitalism, I think that kind of goes directly to, to that, where, you know, where, where there's this recognition that kind of the decay and the falling, you know, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it didn't result in sort of this, this revolutionary sort of my framework, right? It, it was, it was nation states, it was, it was, these you know, nationalities breaking off from this this political order that was falling apart, and um, you know I I think that, that again you know when when the, we're in living this age of kind of, a, kind of an American empire that's kind of falling apart at the seams, people recognizing that uh, you know you, you're more people now you know, doubting the legitimacy of the federal government, you know that that sort of of national liberation sort of approach to politics. Um, is, is something that I think is, is very fascinating. It's something that, that libertarians have to, to grapple with. And, you know, he talks about, you know, the fact that, you know, the biggest mistake that libertarians make is that, you know, failing to recognize that we are, you know, not the obvious, that we are born within a family, with a, we're born within a language, we're born, born within a culture. And so, again, I think all these ways kind of helped, you know, there's so much great theoretical work in, in, in both in the libertarian and the economic side. You know, I, I think there's a lot of the tones of 90s Rothbard that capture the theoretical and put it into the practical. Um, and that, you know, for us trying to build a freer world, there's so much here that, that, that can make that, you know, make that so much easier to accomplish. We don't have to, you know, we, we can build off the, soul, the, 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 the shoulders of an intellectual giant in this regard because he wasn't simply willing to talk about how this stuff in a vacuum. He wanted to see this succeed in the real world. And so that's, that's something that I, I think is uh, often underappreciated and, and there's so much potential really still to, to unwrap. Well, and on those topics, too, one of the nice things about Rothbard is that he takes all those topics very seriously. It wasn't enough to just say, oh, man, these idiots, they don't agree with me, and common sense means you must take this position, and so on. That wasn't enough for him. He really took a historical view and deconstructed these topics, wanted to present a real uh, convincing step-by-step -step argument. And I, and I remember, of course, reading all of that when I was a college student at the time. And that was one of the things I liked about it, is that this was serious writing. This wasn't just a bunch of partisan bomb throwing. And I think that's why it has staying power today is, uh, he takes the topic seriously and wants to really explain it and not just write off a short column that his followers are going to agree with and so on. Cause in that case where I, why would you ever bother reading it five years later? Uh, there's no point because it's just really pandering to a certain group of supporters. But in this case, he's writing it to appeal to a larger group of people who want to actually be convinced and take ideas and, and historical facts seriously. And that's always been one of his strengths. And even if you disagree with him, uh, you can't really deny that this is some interesting information that's being thrown out there that you 
need to consider. And that and the other aspect of that is that he was taking positions that very few other people were taking. Uh, those who who did agree with him, they usually came to those opinions through some less rigorous point of view, and they didn't really know why. Maybe they took that position or it was just based on some sort of emotional feeling, whereas Rothbard was really providing depth uh, to those positions. And in that, he always distinguished himself from the mainstream conservatives and certainly, obviously, from the center left as well. And that brings me to my first point, which one of the endearing things about Rothbard is that the National Review hated him. Uh, and this this is a, a multi-decade thing that occurred. We're going back to the 60s. William F. Buckley decided he hated Rothbard, primarily because of Rothbard's opposition to war. And this continued all the way into the 90s, right up and uh, until Rothbard's death, uh, when National Review still couldn't bring itself to admit that Rothbard was an important person. And they, you could think of National Review as sort of those those groups of snarky people who, and there's somebody there who takes things very uh, seriously, is concerned with morality. Uh, wants to do the right thing. But then there's a bunch of other people in the room are saying, well, we're the grown-ups in the room. And uh, you his hysterical people, you just, you take everything too seriously. So it was always sort of this, uh, the National Review crowd was always sort of this martini sipping, wearing my sport coat with my prep school tie group. And uh, we're in control. And uh, we we have the the sophisticated opinions and anyone who takes any other position either is a communist or a hysterical crazy person. And that was how they generally viewed Rothbard and wanted to portray him, as well as portraying anybody who opposed them on foreign policy. And for them, remember, National Review's main drive was always uh, foreign policy aggressiveness. Was always, They were always a pro-war, pro-interventionist, pro-CIA, pro uh <laughs> <laughs> pro Cold War. This was the driving force behind uh, the conservative movement for the most part during this period, as dominated by National Review. And they hated Rothbard because he led this uh, this faction that was more concerned with morality and peace and natural law and and took those sorts of things seriously. Whereas always National Review always kind of gave the impression that it was just something of a game. Uh, except, of course, if you disagreed with them, then you were guilty of uh, basically supporting Stalin. And I always found that side of it to be pretty idiotic uh, in terms of National Review. And, and I'm coming to it mostly when I was, say, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I, I didn't find it particularly appealing, this group of National Review people. And, they, and there were plenty of them, like in the college Republicans and stuff, who... Uh, they, yeah, it was low taxes are great and, and Bob Dole is wonderful and Clinton's a jerk and all of that. But really fundamentally the state, we have no problem with it. We have no real serious problems with the status quo. We'll just trim a little bit around the edges. And Rothbard wasn't like that at all. He uh, had a totally different view of the world and, and wanted to change things. And I, as a young man, I found that quite a bit more endearing than just sitting back and um, drinking scotch and just trying to convince myself that everything was pretty much fine as long as the right people were in charge. The right people, of course, being, uh, I don't know, the CIA and the neoconservatives at commentary and so on. And I just didn't like that at all. And I like that no matter what, it never had any effect on Rothbard whatsoever. He just kept going with it. And I think he ended up attracting a lot of serious people to him by that, because if you were at all concerned with just preserving civilization as a good thing, <laughs> but you weren't prepared to take this pro-war National Review side of things, where did you go? Because the, the communist left wasn't particularly appealing, and they were very authoritarian, even in the 90s in terms of speech codes and that sort of thing. If you took freedom seriously, you couldn't really take National Review seriously. And so you ended up reading something by Rothbard. Uh, you would come to him through a lot of different publications, and because he would write for anything uh, and any number of publications, he didn't care. And you'd, you'd end up coming across something... And you'd think, wow, this is a guy who's really concerned with uh, doing the right thing. And I found that really engaging and, and find that uh, when I read his works 
to to uh, give it a lot of staying power. That it's it hasn't aged poorly. It's still important, even if he's talking about uh, historical events that no longer are in the recent past or maybe distant and don't seem to have a lot of relevance to us anymore. It it you read it and and you're impressed that this is someone who who really wanted to do something for the better and who wasn't just satisfied with being in charge or having power, which is, of course, what more of the mainstream scholars were doing at the time. But you are not always necessarily out of power, even if you do take a highly moralist, uh, anti-regime standpoint. And that takes us to our next point, though, where uh, you're going to talk about Rothbard's view of Martin Van Buren. So this might seem like a, a bit of an obscure answer, but I, perhaps those are, those are the best ones. Um, you know, Rothbard didn't write a great deal about Martin Van Buren, but if you read, I think, a lot of his analysis, in terms of his understanding about politics in the United States, his uh, history of uh, money and banking in the United States, uh, you know, what he recognizes is that you know, this, this Jacksonian era, um, or obviously there was a big pushback against central banking, um, you had kind of this resurrection of laissez-faire policies. You know, this was following kind of the, the one-party control of the era of good feelings, which historians love. But as Patrick Newman noted um, in his interview with Jeff Dice recently on the, the Human Action podcast, like, you know, this this one-party rule uh, created a lot of cronyism, kind of was a, a portrayal of of the, the Jeffersonian values, right, that this Democrat-Republican party – um, you know, was was originated in, you know, those those, those the anti-federalist ideas were kind of pushed to the wayside um, in favor of this more moderate uh, approach. And it was the Jacksonian era that kind of reset things that kind of, you know, offered this the kind of revival of Jeffersonianism. And even though Jackson is the key figure politically in that, you know, he was he, he you know, won multiple terms as president. He was the the personality cult that kind of kept that whole thing together. Um, you know, Rothbard mentions throughout his work the, the role that Van Buren kind of uniquely played behind the scenes as the the party infrastructure, right? And and you know, when he was asked, you know, who who was your favorite American president? You know, he, he talked about Van Buren because like Van Buren had all of the best qualities of Jackson in terms of his economic philosophy, but without quite the same sort of militant personality um, and, and some of the, the non-libertarian sort of uh, 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 aspects of his presidency. And, and what, what Van Buren did is he kind of laid down the, the intellectual framework for, um, you know, some of the, the bourbon Democrats and those, those free market kind of laissez-faire, anti-state privileged, um, you know, political parties of the 1800s that we've, you know, we've talked a lot about on this podcast. And, you know, because you know, Rothbard rejected kind of this great man of, of history narrative, right? He, he understood that it was ideas and, and ideologies of an era that kind of really helped shape the results and, and really shaped history. It was kind of borrowing from that, the, sharing that Misesian lens on the way that ideas played. And ideas by themselves don't have an impact without building the institutions. And what, what Van Buren was great at was that institution builder. And so I, I think Rothbard's appreciation for that, you know, e even if it's an aspect, you know, again, you know, throughout history, Van Buren was a one-term president. And if that's all you know about him, it's, it's very easy to fail to appreciate uh, the, all of the, the party building aspects that made really allowed for that, that Jacksonian era, which, which obviously did not just simply capture Jackson's presidency but the growth of newspapers and, and Jacksonian politicians and this larger intellectual sphere that promoted the best aspects of that. And obviously, unfortunately, so war, you know, changed American politics in a great deal. Um, you know, uh, uh, Samuel Tilden, a personal favorite of mine, he was a protege of Van Buren, kind of, you know, that, that kind of kept this, resurrected this sort of movement after the Civil War, um, Grover Cleveland, the Bourbon Democrats, all that sort of stuff. And once the progressive era came in, all, all of that sort of Van Buren's work kind of kind of <laughs> went out the window, unfortunately, along with other good stuff. Um, but I, I think that his appreciation, his ability as an economist, as a political theorist to appreciate those contributions, um, I think is great. I think it lended itself to some of his other work. And I guess I think it's it's one of those highlights how, how you could highlight very 
easy to overlook aspects of American history in ways that can be useful as we kind of interact in this this battle of ideas that we face. Yes, I think the temperament of the Jacksonians uh, was very suitable for Rothbard in that these guys were very moralistic and really thought they were being ripped off, that they were being exploited by people in power. And if, if there's a central message to Rothbard, it would seem to be that, that uh, you're being ripped off, you're being exploited, the people in power hate you, and they're hurting you. And the, the Jacksonians certainly had no problem just coming out and saying that without trying to make it seem like uh, they were very calm and uh, collected about it. And uh, populist politics in general was very good. Uh, in that regard. And they were good on the central bank, too, which unfortunately a lot of populists are not today. But that uh, takes me to the issue of uh, Rothbard's alliance with the populists in the 90s, kind of circling back a little bit to 90s Rothbard. But a point I wanted to make about this, and which is so endearing about Rothbard, was that he was against the Cold War. And it, we have to remember that this alliance with the the right wing that a lot of people make a lot uh, a lot of uh, to do over is based on the fact that the populist right the the mainstream right in many cases had abandoned the cold war in the early 90s and this was the driving force behind rothbard's alliance there. And so I, I occasionally see articles or people send me submissions and so on saying, uh, we really should uh, learn from Rothbard's alliance with uh, the old conservatives, with the populist conservative right in the early 90s. And uh, things today are just like they were then. And there's no reason you can't do that now. Well, I, I think it, it it bears reminding ourselves that in terms of foreign policy, the conservatives were actually quite a bit better in the early 90s, as long as you exclude the the neocon right, the, the National Review people, who were very much in the minority, really, if you looked at how conservatives as a whole were thinking. Because what happened was the Soviet Union went away in the late 90s, and there was a sense of, of a certain euphoria among, among many people on the right that now they could get back to normal America. And if you looked at the writings that occurred, I did my master's thesis on this, so I, I would delve into these obscure magazines and and look at what people were writing within the movement at the time. And there was this feeling back in the 50s that, OK, we'll do this Cold War thing and then we'll get back to normal America. And so there, the people who were familiar with that, who still cling to that idea, because often it was a lot of the exact same people who had been alive 30 years earlier uh, when they were writing those sorts of things, thought, oh, finally, the Cold War's over, we can get back to uh, a very localized, uh, restrained America in terms of foreign policy and also domestic policy. And so the, the general feeling among conservatives had changed massively in that uh, early 90s time period. And a lot of that was behind that, that shift it was behind the support behind Buchanan. It was behind uh, the so-called Republican Revolution that occurred in 1994 to some extent, and which, of course, all proved to be really nothing uh, all that important in terms of changing uh, the policy of the party. The Republican Party continued to be dominated by uh, aggressive foreign policy people. But at the time, Rothbard really felt that it was going to be different, and that was a big reason that he ended up being much more friendly and much more willing to work with the conservatives at that time. And had he been around, however, in 2001, uh, the the writings of Rothbard would have looked quite a bit different, because it's uh, important to remember that when Rothbard died, he was still living in this period where the conservative movement was very much up for grabs in terms of who might be in charge of it. And he was trying to push that certain, uh, quote-unquote, isolationist wing of the party. And thinking that he could then turn them against Cold War type thinking and really revolutionize it into a real libertarian uh, party of dissent against the uh, the center left and against the mainstream right that were pushing this aggressive foreign policy. And I, I don't think he succeeded, of course. And then things became much, much worse 
in the early 2000s. And had he been around, of course, he would have been effective at denouncing all of that stuff and would have, of course, hated the Bush administration and wouldn't have been duped at all by all that stuff about how, well, if you don't support the Bush administration, they'll elect some Democrat, things like that. You look at the history of Rothbard when he was supporting guys like Adlai Stevenson and things like that. Obviously, Rothbard didn't go in for that whole choose the lesser of two evils garbage. He uh, voted or at least uh, <laughs> expressed his support. I don't know if he ever voted, expressed his support based on mostly foreign policy, which he felt to be really the key to the whole libertarian question. He thought foreign policy came first, was the most important issue, and next was domestic policy, because foreign policy really drove domestic policy in his thinking. And so when he had when he said sayings like war is mass murder, conscription is slavery, taxation is robbery, this reflected his views, highly moralistic, highly aggressive in terms of his anti-war views. And that was what was really behind his alliance with the conservative movement at the time. And I just want to make sure that that uh, people are aware of this, that this wasn't just some sort of, oh, well, Rothbard had some cultural leanings that led him to ally himself. Uh, no, he understood that the, one of the most popular elements of the conservative movement was actually its libertarian economics. That's always been very popular and a popular aspect of the American right. However, what the Buckley crowd did was, was free ride on that and then paste on top of it this horrible Cold War type ideology that then said, oh, yeah, well, you know, that libertarian thing, that's all right. But what really matters is uh, having a gigantic nuclear war with uh, the Soviets. And of course, we can find all sorts of quotes with these crazed Buckleyites saying things like, if it takes a pile of 10 million corpses, we should do it. Better to just start World War III now than wait for the Soviets to do it. I mean, these people are deeply, deeply nihilistic and immoral and bloodthirsty, and Rothbard knew it and opposed them in every way. So to think that he just was was kind of fine with those people in the early 90s because uh, they, uh, they didn't go in for speech codes and, and they were against PC and stuff, that's not what was really going on. Rothbard was much more concerned with the foreign policy aspect of it, and he thought he could maybe reclaim the conservative movement as sort of a Taftian uh, type of uh, dissenting right-wing party. And that was the goal. And when you when you read his works on this, you can see that the fundamental moralistic nature behind that, what he really wanted was peace and freedom. And it wasn't some sort of uh, really cultural thing that concerned him that much. He just didn't have a problem with right wing cultural mores and was fine with it. And so he, he saw no reason that that should prevent an alliance. And so he went ahead with it. But the the real issue was his love of peace. And and again, that's uh, just one of the things that that makes him so likable. While with the National Review issue, what made him likable was that he didn't care what those people thought. And he was willing to just go headlong in, even if they constantly disparaged him, tried to make the world forget about him. He was go what was, was going to do what was right. But then this wasn't just some weird quirk he had. He was genuinely motivated by a desire for peace, which he viewed as a, a deeply important moral imperative. And that's what drove a lot of his larger issues around political alliances and so on. And so he wasn't kidding when he said war was mass murder. He really believed it. And it's hard to really dislike a guy who's willing to go all the way to the wall on that sort of thing because he thinks it's the right thing to do. A, a man that truly hated the state. <laughs> right. And I think a lot of people didn't really understand that or thought he was cynical about it. But uh, that certainly wasn't wasn't the case. Although we've spent a lot of time talking about Rothbard's foreign policy, or at least I have, uh, I, I think we, we mustn't ignore his his penetrating economic analysis. And, and though you have something to say about that. Yeah. And, because, you know, one of the things that really kind of spoke to me early on is because I, I love when Rothbard has like his narratives of uh, ideas and, and economic thought. And it is his, well, it was one of his, his later works, but it's a, the history of economic thought. Um, you know, a lot of you know, focusing a, a lot on the work before Adam Smith, because you know, what you're told in schools is like, Oh yeah, economics was kind of created, you know, by Adam Smith and before wealth of nations, you know, economics kind of didn't exist. It was, you know, whatever the, the King wanted or, or, you know, you, you talking about, you know, British mercantilism or things like that. But, you know, his, his work in analyzing um, 
you know, for one, I mean, I love the way that his history and economic thought starts off with the Greeks and um, uh, religious scholars, and even uh, he goes into some of the Chinese thinkers and, and highlighting how the, the Taoists were like the original libertarians and contrasting it to the Confucians and all. It, it just it goes to like the, the depth of his knowledge. But in particular, his treatment of Adam Smith, I think, is interesting because in many ways, I think it's kind of an interesting red pill in how sort of the, the mainstream, mainline sort of history of economics is itself kind of manipulated on who we focus on in terms of thinkers. Um, and and so like, I, I love this line that he, you know, the, 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 the Adam Smith myth, um, which is you know, kind of the headlines for one of the chapters within his analysis. I think that the problem with Adam Smith is that he originated nothing that was true and that whatever he originated was wrong that even in an age that had fewer citations or footnotes than his own, Adam Smith was a, a shameless plagiarist uh, and ag acknowledging little or nothing and stealing large chunks from, for example, uh, Richard Cantillon. And so like, here it is, he, he's punching right in the face, you know, the, the, the saint of early economics. And you know, obviously Mark Thornton um, at the Institute, he's, he's done a great job in highlighting the very specific contributions of Richard Cantillon that came before Adam Smith. Um, you know, uh, Rothbard wrote about uh, Turgot and some of these other European thinkers that predated Adam Smith and highlight that there's a lot of great proto-Austrian analysis in terms of, uh, you know, Cantillon, uh, uh, Cantillon uh, you know, his work on um, you know, the Mississippi uh, land speculation bubble and his understanding of kind of the, the, the non-neutral aspect of money and, and you know, the, the, the way that credit expansion exacerbates income inequality and, and boom-bust cycles. You know, there was all this great stuff out there. And then according to like the Rothbardian narrative, Adam Smith is the one that kind of brings in, um, you know, aspects of the labor theory of value, you know, kind of sets the stage in many ways for the groundwork that kind of led to some of Marxists' economic thought. And while there are some, you know, thinkers out there that, that will respond to Rothbard and kind of be critical of some of his analysis, find you know, that this is not where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to interject myself in some of those debates. I think simply the fact that he was able to, to change and alter the way, get, get, get people thinking about this, this proto-Smithian sort of economics is, is something that, it, it go, again, it goes to the way that Rothbard was able to use narrative to, to make you challenge your own underlying assumptions. And that's something that's, that can really, was one of my early catalysts to, to, to being so fascinated by his work. It speaks to, again, how widely he was able to write, to, to write um, and when you really try to think of it in like a pre-internet age in particular, his access to all these kind of very obscure thinkers and things like that, you know, that the, the, the pre-Adam Smith history of economic thought, I think is just really one of those fascinating uh, uh, products of Rothbard that, uh, again, it it's, it's doesn't get, I, I think, nearly enough credit. Um, and again, it's, it's not for everyone, but it's, it's something that definitely uh, excited me as, as an early, uh, you know, when I first got into some of this stuff. Well, this is some of his best work as a historian also, is really outlining uh, the progression of ideas and really changing the, uh, the orientation we have in terms of where did ideas come from and where did the best ideas come from and who are these saints, quote unquote, that we're supposed to look up to and really admire and so on. And, and that, that really had an effect on me too. Now when I see uh, some sort of right winger quote adam smith as if this was some sort of great insight and so on i just kind of like Ugh, right <laughs> not very interesting or engaging surely there's uh, someone who uh, made a better contribution and of course rothbard riley pointed out that smith is if your your purpose is to take a hardcore laissez-faire position smith doesn't really offer much in terms of support for that he was he had very much a mainstream sort of sensibility about him, and there was really nothing all that radical about him. Yeah, he made some economic observations and so on. But we would be much better off, I think, looking to the French liberals if we wanted more radical views and and they they took much more uh, extreme quote unquote positions on things. And they, those are really, I think, what are most exciting and also offer the real, alternative to the status quo, whereas, sure, out of Smith, you can get some opposition to high tax rates, and maybe we should have some low tariffs and sort of thing. 
but that's <laughs> it's it's hard to get super excited about Smith. And I don't know if that's just the way Smith is or if it's because Rothbard really influenced me on that. But looking back at that, there's so many more interesting people we can examine in terms of economic policy and economic thinking. And this focus on the Anglo-Saxon world it was something that Ralph Rako always pointed out, was if it's not written in English, we don't pay any attention to it. And I think that's been a big contributor to Smith's notoriety, is the fact that he wrote in English, and so anybody can pick up his stuff or at least have a copy of The Wealth of Nations on the shelf. I've noticed that everyone seems to have a copy of The Wealth of Nations on the shelf. I don't know if anybody's ever actually read it. I've tried to read it. It's uh, <laughs> If you can find the correct and most famous sections to read, that's somewhat interesting, but boy, there is, that is a lot of pages and a lot of stuff that's not of all that much interest, uh, especially when there's so much more that's been written in the last 200 years that uh, is is more engaging. But yeah, I think with if we hadn't had Rothbard, we would just have this received view that doesn't really offer much in terms of encouragement, in terms of looking at other economists and other views that were being put out there, many of which I think are, are better for actual free market thinking. And so that's five of our top things for Rothbard that uh, we particularly like whether we're talking about uh, the power of the state or war or the economy, I think Rothbard offers a unique view, and, and he certainly wasn't strained by, restrained by what other people thought of him, and I always think that that was one of the, the most endearing things about him. And uh, so here as we move forward with Rothbard Week, I encourage people to look at all the articles we're running. Some of them are personal anecdotes about Rothbard, some are pointing out some of his insights on taxes and economics and really just trying to uh, get a view of, of the wide array of his interactions with people and ideas and really driving home just how much of a monumental thinker he was. So here for the Mises Institute, uh, thank you very much for listening to Radio Rothbard, and we'll be back next week. And until then, have a wonderful week.